Thank you, Swan, for the introduction. Good morning. My name is Wen Yuan Wu, and I am uh, the director of administration with AACE. I recently received a letter from an Asian American Studies program at an Ivy school telling me that you will never be white no matter how, how hard you try. At first, I thought it was from the biology department of that school. And then so, soon I realized that this unnamed person wrote to disparage the very fact that AC is hosting this conference and to express his or her distaste that we invited government officials. So the, just let me, this being said, let me turn to our expert panel for their take on this topic of achieving racial diversity in higher education. I want to tease out three general questions for each of you, and I will ask each of you to take three to five minutes in your answers. One, what is diversity, substantially and empirically speaking? Two, what are the educational, pedagogical, and organizational benefits of racial diversity? Three, in your opinion, what is the best approach to enhance diversity in higher education? Um, okay, uh, so the first question is what is diversity? I would say, first of all, it's a great honor to follow Ward Connolly, uh, who's uh, been a hero of mine for a very long time. Uh, look, diversity, America is a diverse country. We're, we're multi-ethnic. What we have never been in the past is multi, uh, multicultural. That is a new thing. Uh, when diversity means coercive diversity, that is group proportionalism, the, the having in every entity in society, whether it's a classroom, an office, or the legislature, a mirror of the, of the racial composition of the country, that can only be achieved through coercion, that because that never obtains naturally. And that is something that, uh, so when you hear diversity being employed, it is usually it, meaning that it should concern especially a group uh, that is 5.7% of the population, which is Asian Americans. But it's, it's not even that, because as, as was discussed before, Asian American, is, is, it's not really a very meaningful term. It's a, it's a very heterogeneous group. And they are very different rates of success among the groups. And uh, the, the groups that succeed the most, for example, are Chinese Americans or Indian Americans, in terms of if you look at cultural indicators. And so it's even the, 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 the you know, the disproportionate, if you want to look at it that way, the disproportionate uh, uh, existence of Chinese Americans or Indian Americans it, in, a, in a classroom would then be, seem unfair if you take a diversity point of view, uh, being group proportionalism. So I want to alert you to this, to this word, diversity, because we are a diverse country. We have always been diverse. We have been diverse since 1776, before. That's why the founders, the, the, the motto, the, the US motto that the founders you know, uh, came up with in 1776 was e pluribus unum. And they did it for a reason, out of one, out of many, one. And because they knew they had German Americans already, they had Scots Irish, they had many groups, and they knew that one nation had to be forged with uh, joint purposes, with common purposes. So a pluribus unum is to me the right way to achieve diversity, not the coercive diversity that would say, well, there's already too many Chinese Americans at the class at Harvard, that you shouldn't be in any way at all embarrassed by the fact that it, you know the Asian American population at Caltech is 40% of, it would be 43% at Harvard. It's, it's, it, who cares? If, if that is not very diverse, who cares? If people got there because of their achievements, because, got there because of their sacrifice, then the, the group proportionalism or diversity should not really matter at all. At, at least it, I, I, I agree with, with a word that actually is very destructive of our, of our constitutional republic. And your take on the second question? Which is? On uh, the benefits of racial diversity in higher education. Well, that, I guess, comes from Baki, uh, the Baki decision, and which was reinforced by, by uh, Gruder. I, I'll take issue with that as well, because that, uh, what that says is that knowledge inheres in race, that knowledge inheres in, in, uh, in DNA. 
And that is a very un-American way of looking at something. When I come into a group, I am not speaking because of my lived experience as a Cuban American, whatever that is. They, you know, I'm, I'm here as an individual, and it's the power of my ideas that should matter to you. It is I don't have something that inheres in my DNA because of my ancestors, and, and I'm not here to share with you something that is group specific. I'm here to share with you what I have myself arrived at through my own research. Um, so the, the backy decision, I think, it, it, in, in deciding that this, this is a benefit uh, to having a diverse classroom, an educational benefit, and a compelling, a compelling state interest, and then as I said, Gruder uh, uh, cemented that, assumes something that is un-American, which is that there is knowledge that inheres in DNA. And the third question was? The third question is, in your opinion, what is the best approach to enhance diversity in higher education? Sharing best practices. You know, I think uh, uh, Mr. Sander, uh, Richard Sander, talked about that, about the efforts. Once they stopped looking at equalizing outcome in California, they actually started doing serious work. And I think at the University of Arizona, uh, no, sorry, Arizona State is doing the same thing, reaching out to high schools. Rather than, rather than trying to equalize outcome at all costs, do that work. And also, you know, spread best practices. I've looked at the, uh, some of the cultural indicators for Again, I don't, I don't think it was broken down. It's, it's Asian American, which I hate to use because it's, as I said, it's a group, it's a, it's a term that hides many, different, many differences, and I wish we didn't use bad ethnic terms in this country. But if you look at, for example, the out-of-wedlock rate, uh, the divorce rate, uh, the hours of homework done per week, it, 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 you know, first, the out-of-wedlock rate is incredibly low. The, the divorce rate is incredibly low. It's like Virginia in 1952. And, the, and, and, and the, the number of hours of homework done per week is much higher. So I think by sharing best practices, if, if I hear that, they, that what I am doing is gonna harm me personally or harm my family, and I don't change my ways, then I should face consequences until I've changed my ways. We have seen, uh, for example, in 1965, before the Surgeon General went on TV and said that, that smoking killed you, something like 70% of American males smoked. That is very low right now. Uh, before Mothers Against Drug Driving took and, and did such wonderful work in bringing the reality that the driving while intoxicated kill people and will kill you as well, you know, people used to do these things and create great havoc, but we have had great change in our culture as a result of these messages percolating through. And I think if we have the same messages come through that, look, an intact family and emphasizing education is going to be good for your children, uh, I think that actually would benefit and, and would create the diversity that we seek. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McCloskey. Okay, is it okay if I try and answer all three in one, dare I say, holistic <laughs> statement? <laughs> oh, okay, good. Because I, I put together a whole thread of thoughts here and they may just fall apart if I don't keep all of them. Um, <laughs> So I should tell you that sort of my approach to this is what I do at the Cato Institute, a think tank, a libertarian think tank, is I tend to sort of base things on these first principles about what I think public policy should be. Public policies really should be first granted in a philosophy of what law should be. So what I'm going to say is not an endorsement of affirmative action or, uh, or any of the policies that are being discussed at Harvard right now, but it is to draw a distinction, first and foremost, between how we deal with what are public institutions and private, and then I think the answers to your questions will then stem from that, I hope. If not, I failed, which would not be the first time, or the last. Um, so the first thing is to understand that we need to have a distinction between public and private institutions, government institutions, and institutions that exist in free civil society. There is, I see no basis, even though the, the courts, as we've all discussed, have disagreed with me, I don't see any basis to say that a public institution, like the University of Texas or others, should be able to give anybody an advantage or disadvantage based on race. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I think it may come from good intentions, because the reality is, for most of our history, we had policies that were against people based on their race, and we continue to see the negative effects of that. And I do think lots of people think we need to make amends for that. But I don't think the just way to make amends for past race-driven discrimination is 
different kind of race-driven discrimination. We have got to have a system that is truly colorblind. That said, I think you can actually go further than that for public colleges and universities because people will say, well, why might we have an advantage for legacies or for people who are left-handed trombone players or whatever? I think that a public institution, all taxpayers of a state are paying for that. There may be an argument that says admission should be based on lottery. Some maybe floor of academic ability, but after that, a lottery. Because we do not want government picking and choosing to give advantages to anybody versus anyone else. But most of my discussion would be about private colleges, including Harvard. I actually think private colleges and institutions, one, as a philosophical uh, and I think a justice-based argument or an, an argument about how we want society organized is private institutions should be able to make their own decisions about what their admission policy should be. It's certainly fine to say they are wrong, but we should be reticent about saying we are going to use the power of law to make them change that. Now, I know this is a more, uh, a more nuanced argument uh, about what's happening at Harvard, and I'll talk about that in a second. But first, we need to, I think, recognize that private institutions should be treated differently by law than public institutions because we want a maximum sphere of liberty, people able to make decisions for themselves, how they and people who they want to interact with will organize. And we need to make sure we have a clear distinction that way. And then I would also say that, um, and this does, I think, answer one of the three questions, there is actually some evidence that suggests there are benefits from all sorts of diversity within student body. In particular, it, it uh, militates against, for instance, groupthink that you have people who are all the same or very similar together and they don't see preconceptions challenged because they all share those preconceptions. This certainly is much deeper than race, goes far beyond race. I would argue that ideological diversity, philosophical diversity is more important than race. But I do actually think there could be some benefits to saying I encounter in college people with lots of different backgrounds, which includes race and ethnicity. It includes socioeconomic status. I don't know how many people would have a problem with Harvard University, for instance, saying, as I think it does, well, we don't want every student to come from New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, or Massachusetts. Uh, I think a lot of sort of more elite colleges, or at least that have a, a national basis they draw from, I think try hard to say we want geographic diversity. Would we say that's something they shouldn't have, or is there some benefit to someone who's from New York, meeting someone from a farming family in Kansas, meeting somebody from uh, uh, Silicon Valley in California. There are good, I think, arguments uh, for a sort of diverse student body. And I do think that if you look at the history of discrimination in this country, backed, enforced, and sometimes driven by law, there are good arguments to say there needs to be some way to compensate groups that were discriminated against by law based on their race that does take race into consideration, but we cannot have government do it. That means private entities should have the ability to make decisions for how they'll organize and say, we may give some additional benefit to somebody if they are from a group that continues to suffer the legacies of government-based racial decisions. We don't want government making those decisions, but I think we need to have a sphere where people can make those decisions themselves. And the, I think that ultimately, the fact of the matter is there are lots of competing values at stake here. Lots of different or competing ways of looking at what is just, what is unjust, how much value is there put on a diversity in your student body, what kind of diversity is that. And as long as we have lots of competing views and values and decisions that have to be made by people, we want to have a maximum ability to have a diversity of answers from institutions of what is the right way to deal with all the competing values and all the competing things that have happened in history to get the right mix of students. So I think sort of the, the answer that may encompass all three questions is we've got to let free people and free society from the bottom up come up with all sorts of solutions for the problems that we face. Thank you, Dr. McCloskey. Um, Ms. Manga? Um, what is I your think take? today, I'm, I'm, thanks for having me on this panel with all the esteemed uh, guests here. Uh, today, I've already heard 
color blindness three times, and I am so happy. Uh, for the first time in my life, I'm happy about it because I've always been treated and be told that I'm colorblind. And I think I'm in the right business today and the right <laughs> panel today because we are, this fight is about being colorblind. And this definitely will enhance the experience of the students holistically if they are considered from socioeconomic backgrounds uh, coming from different experiences. That's what enhances the experiences of sharing experiences with the other students with different experiences. But to me, the color itself is not a diversity. Experiences make the difference in enhancing your education, your outlook, and your perspective about life, about uh, living a certain life, living in a certain environment. That's what is more rich. It is just not uh, race being a uh, diversity. What is it as an AACE uh, board member, I believe, uh, people always ask me, what's your organization? What are your basic principles? Yes. I am proud to say our basic principles are not race-tagged education for Asian Americans, Black Americans, or anybody. We want equal education rights for everybody. Does that preclude uh, poor economic, social uh, background children? No, we do not want to in exclude them. We want to include them. How do we include everybody? By only focusing on the root cause of the problem. Why are we all the time f arguing and talking about how these colleges are grading and giving grab points to an applicant? Instead, should we all not start taking a step back and looking at what has transpired these colleges, in fact, to make that step, K-12 is the key. Focusing on better education, good education, is the basic principle that we should all be focusing on and operating on. Why? I mean, a lot of people may uh, say, Asians are trying to take away our children's spots. No, we are not. We are, in fact, trying to make the life of all community children to have better education. What would be a better platform when all race children are treated alike? That's where they bring the enhancement of experiencing a holistic education. Just the bookish knowledge doesn't make them a good student. It is the holistic experience. And that's exactly what we want to bring to table for the Americans. As the progressive Americans, we do not want to focus on color. If you were to ask me, what would you like to be addressed as? I'll say, stop, don't call me Indian American. <laughs> I am just as American as you are. Thank you. And to your second part of the question, this is what I feel. The press position 209, when it was banned, black en enrollments dropped. But the graduating levels and their gr uh, scores went up. What does that have to tell us? Don't believe in this mismatch. You can put somebody in a spot that they are not interested. I'm not saying they don't deserve. Maybe their heart is someplace else. By AA, you're just trying to put somebody, push somebody into a spot that they are not interested. Don't take away the spots that somebody else can use and identify the talents and interests of the children that you want to push up. Encourage them in the direction they want to be progressive. 
That's what I would say we need to start focusing on. Identify the interest. Give them the better education, K-12. Even if they have to drop out of college, give them a vocational training, they can be better citizens. They can be better knowledgeable. Education alone doesn't make somebody a better person, it's the knowledge. That's where the K-12 has to start focusing on. And I'm, I'm really thankful to uh, Dr. Yukong Zhao. He's the one that truly inspired me. I was an activist. I think I was a little directionless. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And he put me. And Swan is another one that inspires me a lot. You know, there are so many people right around us to inspire us, to get us to the right direction. Identify where your heart is and encourage your children to go in the right direction. Never encourage your children to focus on race. Color is nothing but just a skin. I appreciate all your input uh, on this discussion, very important and interesting discussion on race, diversity, and how we can achieve that in higher education. So let me, now I want to just ask each of you some individualized questions. Let me start with Mike. This question sort of echoes what Neil and Manga talked about. So, so far as education is concerned, some would argue that diversity in thoughts and ideas and that of socioeconomic background are as important as, if not more than, diversity of skin color. Do you agree? In other words, should diversity be primarily primarily related to racial diversity or other forms of diversity? Well, I, uh, yeah, I mean, very quickly, I, I made that very clear. I don't think there are any gains to be had for having a color-coded classroom. I think that the gains are there to be had for diversity of thought and diversity of experiences. Yes, I, I agree with diversity of experiences, but that does, we should not assume that that adheres to a, a group, that an experience adheres to members of a group. Uh, and that, that's where I think, so I, I do take great issue. I, I agree with, with Neil on the part of having a diversity of ideas, which is sorely lacking in our universities in case anybody has noticed. And that is where the crying shame is. But it's, it's not this idea that, you know, why should we assume that a, a black student uh, from California is going to bring with her or with him a certain set of ideas? That, that is, to me, that is a, at a very basic level un-American. Uh, so I, 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 as I said before, I deeply, deeply disagree with the Bakke decision, with the Gruda decision on, these, on this score. And I like to say other things, but I, if you ask me a question, I answer the question, I'll move on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. So Manga, my question to you is, if the race factor were to be eliminated in school admissions, how would you address the racial achievement gap in education? even within the Asian American community, for example. A popular belief holds that those of Southeast Asian origins are still underperforming educationally. How can we help? By giving them good education, K-12, as I've already mentioned. That is the key to creating that interest part, interest core for every child, where they want to be instead of forcing them to do what we want them to do, where the education system is pushing them to compete <coughs> against scoring, which is scores are important. But then education, K through 12, is the most crucial thing that we can actually give our next generation and the present generation. So can we say that we want equal opportunity, true equal opportunity, not yes. equal outcomes. Yes, the, it should be completely equal opportunity. Race should never be a factor. Every child should be given the same exact opportunity given their interest and where they wanna go. Okay, thank you. Let me turn to you, Neil. My question for you, if race-based affirmative action works, why are its intended beneficiary groups more underrepresented at top schools than 35 years ago, as pinpointed by a 2017 New York Times article. And in your opinion, 
what is the root cause behind the lack of racial diversity in higher education, and how should we address it? Can you repeat the first part of that question? Yes. There was two parts, right? Two parts. Okay, so yeah. the Let first part is, if race-based affirmative action works, why are its intended beneficiary groups more underrepresented at top schools than 35 years ago? Okay, uh, I don't know that it works. Uh, I'm not making an argument that says that affirmative action has been effective at what it says it's going to do. I've read Mismatch, uh, and I think that probably many of the conclusions are right. Uh, again, my position is more from sort of a philosophical uh, position of what should the law be. So I'm not advocating for affirmative action. I'm advocating for private institutions to have the ability to have uh, all sorts of admissions policies if they want them. But I'm not going to argue that affirmative action has been successful. Of course, I'm also not sure that there's a uniform definition of what people want from affirmative action. Can I make a comment on that? I think sure. if private institutions behave like Hillsdale College and did not take any federal money, then in that case, they can do whatever they want. But as long as they take federal money, there's such a little thing called Title VI which makes it illegal for them to discriminate on the basis of race or ethnicity, which is the reason why they hide all these things. And we need to think also, because really the Bakke decision was, was really paperwork, but people actually th think of racial preferences the way Neil referred to as making amends for past, um, for past discrimination, except that the vast, the, the vast majority of beneficiaries uh, for, of, of racial preferences today, their grandparents were not here to suffer any any harmful effects of discrimination. We talk, this, is, this is why the Achilles heel of racial preferences is having it applied to immigrants and the children and grandchildren of immigrants. You know, it, no, somebody who has come in in the last 50 years has not really, don't, don't, ha, don't have any history with past discrimination. And in fact, they came to this country knowing what this country was about. And as speaking as somebody who came in and feels very lucky to have been able to come in because it, it provided my family an escape hatch from communism, I don't understand what, what amends must be made for me. For my, my grandparents were not in any way har harmed by anything that happened in America. So, what, so I think actually that is farcical to think that I'm a, I am owed any amends or anybody who it fits in my category. Am I allowed to answer that? Yeah. <laughs> I may not get to the second part of the question, but um, because I was actually going to talk about that, but decided in the interest of time, I wasn't going to get into it. But uh, I think you're absolutely right that what complicates what I'm talking about is the presence of federal aid. Certainly any federal aid directly to the institution, that is a huge problem. I worry a great deal, though, about if we're going to say that if you have student aid, and a student chooses to take that money to an institution that may have all sorts of different um, uh, admissions policies, that that then means that aid, which is supposed to be based on an individual decision, should carry federal rules that say you must do this or you must do or must not do something. I completely understand the concern because we're saying that's money that comes from me as a taxpayer and I don't like it going to a discriminatory school. But I do actually continue to think you can have good arguments for having a uh, lots of different ways you weight different factors in your admissions. And I don't think we want to have a country where the federal government supplies student aid and then says everybody must be the same, especially since in the present system, and believe me, I'm all for getting rid of the aid, which we could talk about another time. But <laughs> I would imagine you wouldn't yeah, be good yeah. from Cato. That's right. But in the present system, there are very few Hillsdales because the fact of the matter is it would be impossible to have a lot of Hillsdales because there is so much federal aid, almost every school has the need to take in that aid to be competitive. So I worry that we have this federal aid and that not only is the aid bad for lots of reasons, but then we can attach rules that, that crush liberty and diversity and pluralism in what schools do, which is sort of compounding the problems that go with that. But then you have to get rid of Title VI. Well, I mean, I think that there's a great argument for saying, shouldn't the private sphere be treated differently from the public sphere? And I think that there are lots of arguments that we haven't had because people maybe are afraid to do this, but to say, when, what do we allow legally to happen, even if we find it repugnant? And then the way that we deal with it is not to say it's illegal, it's we find those people who are doing things we think are repugnant, we say, this is repugnant and we will not deal with you. Um, 
but I really think it's crucially important that we have a private sphere that is big and protected. Otherwise, we end up having a situation where actually everything becomes a zero-sum game because we fight for control of government that will make rules for all people and say this is okay and this isn't. Uh, may I answer this question, please? Sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, I have no problem having affirmative action when it is implemented the way it was created to be implemented. Yes. What about Civil Rights Act, Article 6? It clearly states you may give preference to disadvantaged women, children, whatever that category is, but without causing distress or putting pressure on others. Are these private institutions not part of United States of America not to be following the civil rights that are by constitution? That's where I have my thoughts. If civil rights is for the entire country, it should apply even to private institutions. That should be no uh, exclusion from determining or accepting the responsibility that they have to follow certain civil rights clauses. Okay, so Manga, just to follow up on your comments, uh, my last question is someone claims that 60% of Asian Americans support race-based affirmative action. Is it true? Um, you know what, in the past, that's a very tricky question. You know, uh, in the past, about maybe 10, 15 years ago, when this was, survey was taken, Asians were not even aware they were being discriminated. And the way that question was framed was so confusing. They thought that they were going to benefit, so they said yes. So that's what is coming to hurt us. Now we are realizing that question itself was not framed right. It was tricky. So we are now in a threshold. Either we fight or we go extend with our rights. That's where we are. Right now, the situation is, yes, 73% of Americans say that is wrong. I, I just looked at the numbers this morning, and it's 70% oh, for Asian Americans. But again, 70%. Asian Americans yeah. is a, yeah. so what does it mean? So if you strip away Chinese Americans, there, Chinese Americans is falling precipitously. It's down to 40%. Uh, support for racial-based preferences. Mm -hmm. That is still incredibly high when you compare it to the American population. The Hidden Tribes Project, a, a very exhaustive report that was a study that was published last year, uh, showed that only 15% of Americans support racial preferences. Right. This is supported by a very tiny sliver of the population. Uh, and, and I say, you know, I, I'm willing to grant that people have good intentions in doing these things. It just I don't think they appreciate how it stigmatizes success for the intended beneficiaries of, 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 of these things. There are many elements here that are, that are bad, but one of, the, 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 one of the, the least discussed ones is that it, everyone assumes, oh, well, you got in because of racial preference. No, you may have worked your butt off to get into an elite school and then have somebody assume that you got in because you were a quota is highly offensive, and the system invites that. Thank you. So thank you for this very informative debate. I'm going to open up the floor for questions. I'm going to ask the audience to keep your questions short and sweet so that we can proceed with the event on schedule. OK, first, uh, yeah. uh, okay. So first I want to clarify one thing. Basically, the, in January, Pew Research Center already released more scientific survey, says 59% Asian American are against affirmative action, risk-based college admission. Okay, so that's one first. My question is to Mike. I really like your idea. 
promoting best practice to help minorities to improve the quality, like uh, education, right? But uh, you know, I encountered the very strange things in America. What it is? You know, Asian Americans, we never ask for any favor, never ask for any preference in education, but uh, we have overwhelmed success over there. And uh, we were blamed as overrepresented in our elite universities. But on the other hand, when somebody publishes a New York Times, one article says, you know, uh, Asian American from East Asia, they benefit from Confucian values, which emphasize education, which I believe is best practice. But immediately, a lot of mainstream media attack these articles. They don't want to really say what cultural values are good, what are less you know, desirable. So Mike, the question is, how do we explain this situation? You know, and also in our national conversation on education, suppose if we are doing well, why not invite Asian Americans to share our experience? But if you look at the education forum, Asian Americans rarely be invited to, into this dialogue. Why is that? Well, let me clarify. I did not say minorities when I, I talked about uh, racial preference. I don't use the term minority. I don't think that way. It's actually for everybody. Many white Americans also have cultural indicators that are, you know, not very good. So it is really for all Americans that we and, and it's just say this is what leads to success. This is a success, uh, you know, uh, sequence. If you follow this, if you don't smoke, you have a higher rate of not dying for cancer. If you don't drive drunk, people have understood that. But they have, we haven't really made a, an emphasis yet on the success sequence of, of, of graduating, marrying, and then having children. And that helps greatly with success in life. But that's for all Americans. That's not for, I don't use the term minority. Uh, one thing that I think, if, you are, if, we, if we are to generalize, and I hate generalizations, but I, I think the success of many Chinese Americans and, and maybe Confucian practice, cultural, culture matters. DNA does not matter, culture matters. Um, I think that you're taking care, Chinese Americans are following the road to success of individual remedies. They're, they're, they're not, it's not a group mobilization, which is what the left wants, they want group rights. They want, they, they, they preach this all the time and, and, you know, and they've done this now for 30 or 40 years. It's like, no, I'm going to, as I said, follow the success sequence and I'm going to, I'm going to emphasize education. I'm not somebody who says that everybody has to go to college, by the way. We, we have, there are many problems with the system we have in America today that to become a barista, you have to have a college degree. Uh, and, and we can go on for hours as to why that is. Uh, and, 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 but, and I don't want to get into that, let me not go off on a tangent, uh, but I think the, the, the reason why the success that Chinese Americans and Indian Americans are having is because your approach is an individual one. I'm going to remedy, and, and no, I don't need group rights. I don't need group creation, and I don't need any, any of this. I'm going to follow this success by myself, and anybody, any American, and I'm, by the way, I'm speaking about Americans. I'm not speaking about Chinese. Or, so, so I'm not speaking about international students. I'm talking about Americans. I don't care. As I said, Americans of Chinese origin or Americans of Indian origin. What I care about is the American part. Uh, and, and so any American who follows these things, will, I think, will have a better chance of succeeding. Well, the mainstream media. I don't. I, I, I was a journalist for 20 years, so I don't want to. I don't want to. If I didn't have, if, because as a journalist for 20 years, if I didn't have liberal friends, I wouldn't have any friends. So I don't want to. I love you, journalists. I don't want to attack them. <laughs> AJ. Uh, hi, my name is AJ. I am one of the board members here at for AAC. Um Actually, I must tell you that I am so tired of being called a man of color. I'm so tired of living. I never thought that that is my life you know, or that defines me. And I don't want that to define me at all. You know. I don't want, I want the world 
race to disappear from this country, vocabulary, and I want that to happen. Now, one of the reasons why, I mean, I very much support President Trump's idea of meritocracy, and this is, meritocracy is the reason why we need to not just simply go for a certain type of action, affirmative action or anything like that, is because uh, in a short term, of course, we have competition that we have to do well co compared to other countries. But I'm looking at a long-term thing. For humanity to prosper faster, not just humanity, but all life forms to prosper and do well in this world, we have to be appreciative of talent. We have to be appreciative of knowledge gathering. For all of those things, also, we require merit to be more important. And, in, in, and because of that, I think that if our, uh, our ideas of how to proceed is based also on that, that would be better. In other words, all I'm also saying is that discrimination against anybody is wrong and bad, but preferential treatment, which can hurt this merit meritocracy thing, is also bad. That's my answer. Do you have any question, AJ? No. Okay. <laughs> my Thank question you. is, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen over there. Okay. Um, this is for the Cato Institute. I have this little constitution in my pocket. I, I should just say I speak for me, not for the Cato. <laughs> oh no, no, no! Uh, they're gonna, a no, lot of I people like are going to have to go by this I, microphone. I, I, absolutely, but um, for the, the work. So um, I'm Gwen Samuel. I'm a mom. I'm from Connecticut, um, and. I'm not colorblind, because I think diversity is beautiful, right? Learning, I learned so much from the Asian community just in a dinner yesterday. But I am trying to wrap my head around if it's unconstitutional to discriminate, if the 14th Amendment provides equal treatment, then how are the laws of racial uh, quotas, how are they passing? The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And it's not negotiable. So can anyone answer, like, how are we getting there if it's clearly illegal? I mean, Connecticut, we're known as the Constitution State, and we're just violating the Constitution, like, left and right. <laughs> I, I know I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. And I can get why people are feeling hopeless and helpless. Because if the law of the land doesn't protect you, right, because you can't legislate the heart. You can't make someone like someone, right? But the law is supposed to protect all of us. So what is the rationale, and how are they getting away with it so that we can undo it? Yeah, well, so... Uh, my first answer for why are people not paying attention to the Constitution is we don't get enough donations to the Cato Institute where we <laughs> always talk about... The Constitution comes first when we ask what the federal government should do and lots of other things the government does. So that's number one, way up there. Um, uh, I do think that, uh, in all seriousness, I don't think that people ask, what does the Constitution say? And I think when they do ask it, it's often for rhetorical purposes, not to actually see what does the Constitution say and what is it supposed to do. Um, and I've been saying this in all areas of policy for a very long time. I think every time we talk about uh, certainly the federal government and then when states or even local actors do something is, what does the Constitution say? And we simply don't ask that anymore because too many people want things to happen that aren't constitutional. And, and it goes far beyond the topic we're discussing here. Um, as far as what I said earlier, the 14th Amendment uh, as I think it was originally written, well, as it reads now and as it was intended, it's not supposed to apply to private actors, it's supposed to apply to government. Um, now, we don't apply it to government when we should. We do, I think, too often apply it to private actors when we shouldn't. But again, it's because I don't think that the, enough people in the country are interested 
enough in what the Constitution actually says, what it is supposed to, what those words mean, and then to follow it before the government acts. I think we decide we want the government to do something, and then if we can find a constitutional justification for it, great. If not, we just do it anyway. It's probably not the answer you wanted, but it's kind of a soapbox issue. Um, hi, just uh, I have a quick question about the uh, uh, affirmative action because people are talking about affirmative action. I did some research. Uh, originally, it starts in uh, President Candidate's um, Executive Order 10925. It says, take affirmative action to ensure that applicants are employed and that employees are treated equally during employment without regard to their race, grid, color, or national orange. Repeat. Yes. Without regard to their race, grid, color, or national orange. So now after all these years, now you can tell me this is out of date, this is wrong, this is uh, blah, blah, blah. Now my question to your panel, each four of you, uh, in each, each one of you, of your four, um, do you agree that uh, the, uh, each applicant should be employed uh, and that the employees are treated during employment without regard to their race, creed, color, or national origin? Do you agree, yes or no? Yeah, obviously I agree with you on that. That was the first mention of affirmative action in that executive order by Kennedy, but that's been completely turned on its head. And I think the reason why it ha I've looked into this, and the reason why the civil rights, by the way, the civil rights movement and act have been turned on its head as well, is because we made the mistake of analogizing the, the unique experience of African Americans, and it was a unique experience, to a whole raft of other groups that were created uh, synthetically in many cases, and then they had to be convinced, by the way, and we have the evidence because the UCLA, the Ford Foundation paid UCLA a, lot, UCLA a lot of money to canvas people in the Southwest. They had to be convinced to, to think of themselves as the victims of oppression. You know, the, the UCLA researchers came back in the late 60s and said, you know, they, don't, they actually feel they have individual agency. Uh, so, so I think analogizing the unique experience of African Americans to a raft of other groups has created a lot of the problems that we had, but you're right. That is. That, that executive order has been completely flipped. I'll just say yes. <laughs> uh, you know, from my own experience, the why I support the unique experiences do, it's, uh, it's almost like a marriage. For, ex for instance, my own life, my f husband came from a very poverty-stricken family where my mother-in-law ate just half a meal a day and had only two pairs of clothes for several years so that she can educate her children. From that background, my husband came. He was an engineer and he was an MBA student and he got all those degrees and I got married to him. Guess what, what, what my economic background was? I was raised in riches like a princess. Even my neighbors did not see me. That's the lifestyle. But our marriage lasted for 36 years. Why? Because we shared that socioeconomic experiences, the rich experiences we had to blend in, to complement each other, to learn, and to enhance our experience of life. So is the same with the education when you have diverse economic groups sharing the same platform, sharing the same classroom, and share their experiences. I'll do, I'll do a short one. So, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm from uh, Silicon Valley Chinese uh, Association Foundation. So we have support, uh, you can say, very many times. So the, my question is that if these are the wrong thing to happen at all due to any uh, racial uh, discrimination or college remission, and it is against the Constitution, and uh, it's not bring anybody benefit, it's further divide the society community, why people are still doing that. Because uh, in the professional world, I see that 
uh, we're seeing that diverse inclusion happen push into the company. So it's, I mean, we have a lot of doubt about that. So, but if it's the wrong thing to, to happen in the first place, why, you know, their dark force, or I mean, the Li Chen Messenger, the multi billion dollar industry behind it. So I don't know whether uh, panelists, any of you can kind of answer the question, but that's kind of my question. Thank you. Well, very quickly, I think that 15% that does support affirmative action, I actually I call it racial preferences, they're overrepresented in the, in, in the academy, they're overrepresented in the cultural making institutions, and I think that that is why it's, it's very difficult. People get the impression that racial preferences enjoy white support in the American population. They don't. Uh, but, but the academy really, really likes this. So and that's one of the reasons it keeps coming back to the Supreme Court and keeps winning by ever, ever smaller margins, but keeps winning. And I would say, go, focus on K-12, uh, the education on K-12, and then the college admission should be purely merit-based. And of course, you can always have a, a, a reasonable amount of socioeconomic backgrounds and other uh, whatever uh, percentage you want to give for the disadvantaged that's fine, but then it should be mostly meritocracy. Do you have anything to add, Neil? Oh, well, I mean, I, what I want to say is, if we're talking about all, because I think you talked about employers, not just academia, but employers, the answer is I don't know why lots of different people have lots of different policies. I tend to assume that they're not motivated for bad reasons that they have these policies, and that's again why I think it's so important that we have a, as broad a sphere of private action as we can possibly have, because there are myriad reasons people make all sorts of different decisions, and I'm not prepared to say that because the outcome looks like something that it's either they're badly motivated or that it's even the wrong outcome, but that's because they're, you know, hundreds of millions of people in the country, and I can't possibly know what they're all thinking or feeling. One last question. Um, my name is Kenny Shu. Um, common argument, uh, Manga and anyone else, um, is that certain people of certain groups, like if you're from like an inner city, poor community, neighborhood, stuff like that, your low socioeconomic status, you suffer through greater challenges. Um, and so the score or the traditional metrics of how you measure whether someone is meritorious or not to enter this university doesn't reflect their experiences like grades, SAT scores, et cetera. Um, and how, what would be a response to that in terms of um, upholding these ideals of meritocracy that you value? You're asking me? <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, meritocracy one can only ex exceed in their education when they have an holistic approach and sharing that happens in a classroom right from kindergarten. If everybody is treated alike, if everyone is given the same opportunity to avail the same level of education, then what is the issue in the colleges applying meritocracy because you have already put the kids K to 12 through an environment of sharing and everybody has the same level of education. They all are on the same platform by the time they go to college. Yes, they do go through difficult times. Yes, when I came here, I went through difficult times and so my little boy has to go through difficult times in school, but still, he didn't stop performing in school because he had gone through experiences of other students that are rich, that are moderately economic, so from uh, economic backgrounds, and also the poor backgrounds. So he got a holistic view of what life can offer him. That makes a person a better person, and that can also enhance your uh, academics in school. Not necessarily that just because you're coming from a poor economic background, you cannot perform in academics. 
No, you have to put the child in a right environment, then every child can perform well. I just want to say something brief that I think that the term meritocracy has been, has been hijacked almost and politicized to be, to, be, to be equated as scores only. That is not true. I can, we can say that meritocracy is, can be a very holistic system when we look at scores, uh, other academic extracurriculum credentials, it's not, it's not just scores. Yeah, and I think that's right. Um, I think that I do a lot of K through 12 policy and we've sort of, in the last 10 years, but really reflected on policy since 2015, No Child Left Behind Act was all about test scores. Um, and so was some federal policy before that. And there's been kind of a revolt nationwide against this idea of, of what is good education can be reduced to standardized test scores. And we're trying to look at more measures of, well, how do we say a school or a kid is successful beyond just how do they do on the test? But this, again, points to why we need to have as diverse uh, a set of providers and as wide an opportunity for people to make different decisions as possible because we don't actually know what merit is. We don't agree on where merit is. And we need to allow different schools, different families, different communities to have different definitions of what that is. If we don't have one set answer, and we shouldn't, and we don't, we need to have a diversity of answers. And that's why we want to maximize the, the private sphere. Um, so that lots of different things can be tried.